Jeff, it's it's not probably not often that we see a film that's uh, indebted to both George Romero and Elenisa Obensalvan. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but, that's a weird uh, cross section. But uh, yeah, not not a, not a Venn diagram we see a lot. And um, <laughs> no. curious for the film and the construction of it, this was something you'd worked on. Did it come to you scene by scene, uh, or was it kind of a did it amass flesh over time to kind of uh, build up the story that you were told here tonight? I don't um, know any other. I I had to grow up to write it, if that makes yeah. any sense. But um, it really, I mean, what what what's up on screen? I mean, it it it, it ended up being a a big amalgam of stuff. It was never really didn't really. It started at the writing, but it ended up kind of morphing into something else because of the uh, just the compromises you have to make. And I think anybody who's ever done anything, any kind of artistic endeavor, they know that at some point compromises can help or they can hinder. But I think for the most part, we were a crew that had worked together for years and years, so we were able to kind of uh, almost improvise a movie. Um, I, I, when I was thinking of composing some questions to ask, I, I wanted to ask, like, are you surprised there's not more indigenous dystopian stories? But then perhaps all indigenous cinema is in some way dystopian, if you get my meaning. Yeah. I know uh, Lisa Jackson talked about Badab and her VR piece and how about people talked about how it looked very post-apocalyptic. But then she said, well, who's to say the apocalypse didn't happen 151 years ago? when the settlers came to North America. And, and, and is, is this a natural extension of indigenous cinema for you, uh, but taking it to these uh, dystopian extremes? Um, I don't know. I mean, it's, uh, I, I, it's, a, it's a fad in filmmaking. I mean, you have to kind of acknowledge that, first of all. And I think when you're, when you're, when you're just trying to get your story told, I mean, I know I deliberately latched on to the idea of doing a zombie movie specifically because it was so popular, because you could wrap these ideas up in in a, a, a genre film that almost has a guaranteed audience. I think a lot of people out here are probably just here to see a zombie film. <laughs> because it, 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 I mean, they're, for whatever reason, I mean, it's always fun to see a new zombie film. and. I think uh, you you see the popularity of of The Walking Dead. I mean, even when it's kind of dull, people still tune in because there might be a zombie or two in there. <laughs> this is your uh, your second feature. We had Rhymes for Young Ghouls at the festival in 2013. Both of them do kind of like play upon. Uh, uh, they they cut to some graphic novel inspired sequences and. Mm -hmm. uh, are you are you equally indebted to other other forms, be it graphic novels or uh, or fiction, as you are to cinema? I, I think I, I think, uh, I think cinema is almost incidental. I think it's because it's it's just uh, it's this amalgam of all these other different art forms. You can really you could be a painter or you could be a musician or you could be a writer, and you'll still find a niche for whatever your craft is in film because it's like I said, it's an amalgam of all these different art forms. So for me, I mean. It was a, a platform for, for, for me to continue like drawing and for, for me to continue writing and do, do the music. I mean, every time I watch it, I, I kind of listen to the music because that's, that for me is the, the most engaged that I am, which is, is weird to say since I wrote and directed the whole thing. <laughs> but I'm most engaged during the music because it's something that happens as I watch the film. It's not something that... I plan out step by step. I'll be like, hit play, hit record, let's see what I come up with. And it, it morphs into a song, or we kind of just leave it as is, like some of the more softer notes towards the end were just improvised on the spot as I was watching it. So for me, it's, it's the most uh, immediate of the art forms, you know what I mean? You, you can really get your emotions out in the moment, how you're feeling, watching the images for the first time in music. So every time I see it I hear the music. And it was a it was a fun it was a fun soundtrack to write because I had never leaned so much on 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 keyboards because I'm not a very good piano player. <laughs> I'm not a very good uh, synth player. 
I'm more of a guitar guy, so it was kind of a, a leap of faith that I'd be able to record a, a, a synth soundtrack for the film. I mean, you, you've already written and directed the damn thing. <laughs> did, did you really <laughs> have to choose to score it as well? I think for me, it's the easiest part of the process because it's like all the work that came before it. If you if you have an idea of what you're doing with the film, then you're you're gonna know what the emotion is. So it's just a matter of finding the right keys and making sure we're on beat. And it's the fastest, easiest, best part of the process for me making the music because it just comes so naturally. It it, it just flows out of me. So it's 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 a relief to be able to get some sort of. Uh, um, uh, what's what's the word I'm looking for? Satisfaction. <laughs> yeah. There you go in the process, because you're you're able to really put a final stamp on it with music. Right, you're doing it for such a long time. I mean, it's a huge part of your life, and you're letting go of it for the first time, and you're doing the music. So it can be quite an emotional experience, and it's it's uh, it's it's almost like seeing it for the first time, and and being able to do the music for the first time because you're capturing the moment the emotional moment, not the, the almost the, the science that goes behind making the image, but the emotion that goes by, that, that you, you, you kind of use to think it up, to, to conceive the image in the first place. Fantastic. I've asked a lot of questions. Do we have questions out here in the audience? <laughs> and the I question is about the title of the You know what, I, I have no idea. I mean, uh, I think <laughs> it, it was probably one of the first things that I thought of because it, it just seems like the, uh, you know what the weird thing is? I wasn't prepared for how many people wouldn't understand where it came from because they, they kind of likened it like to a, almost a, you know, a throwaway action title like Quantum of Solace or, or <laughs> something like that. <laughs> so people didn't get that it was an actual, you know, on the books law or, or that it was a, like this enforced practice at, at one point. Or actually, not even one point. I mean, there's a lot of tribes that still use blood quantum as a as a, 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 a stepping stone to enrollment. So um, I took it for granted, and this is weird because I, I I'd already experienced this with rhymes, where I was shocked that nobody knew what residential schools were going to be. So I was I was not prepared for people not knowing what blood quantum was either. So there was a debate for a second or two as to whether or not we should define it at the beginning of the film. And we found that because it's been so widely used, like there's been so many different definitions of it, to kind of define it is to throw your hat in an arena that has no real closure. It's just a circular argument that's going to go around forever. So we decided not to really address it, I mean, not necessarily not to address it, but there was like no definition at the beginning of the film. We just assumed the audience would figure it out at some point that Blood Quantum isn't just a title. It's actually, a, like I said, an on the books law that um, that's that's racially based and you know pretty pretty complicated that a lot of tribes need to deal with with. They're enrolled members. Anyway, I mean, all that to say, this this <laughs> this film didn't try to tackle the issue in in the sense that it was going to define it for anybody or or uh, solve it for anybody. I think when you start making films like that, you're you're throwing your hat in an arena that you know again has no has no real way out. It's just going to be a circular argument. Maybe we'd have another one right here and then back there. So there's going to be a lot of genre stuff from native filmmakers coming out in the next you know, couple of years. And uh, I think this is just like the first little ripple that you're, you're going to see. And it's like a, it's a, it's, it's, it's a first stab, too, I think. <laughs> Uh, you know, I, I said it, and <laughs> I heard it coming out, and I'm like, ah. yeah, yeah, unintentional pun. Um, 
but it, w it really is a first stab at uh, making um, an indigenous zombie film or, or you know, whatever the case may be. I think um, there's going to be some growing pains. I mean, there's going to be, a, you know, a lot of things that seem kind of clunky. But I think that that step needs to be taken in order for, you know, everybody to kind of just relax and, and realize that it can be done. And once you, you kind of take that step, then you're going to see a lot of other, you know, you're going to see a, a, lo a lot of other filmmakers and producers take it also. And then you're going to start seeing a lot of those stories. So I, I'm, I know at least three, four, and a couple of TV shows that are coming out that are going to be not necessarily zombies, but uh, werewolves, um, aliens. <laughs> I don't know what Dennis has in mind, but I mean, it, there's going to be a lot of really good genre stuff coming up from Native filmmakers. It's a really kind of exciting time to be a, a part of the industry. Uh, there was a question along the side there. Just purely numbers now. How much uh, <laughs> fake blood do you use and whatever <laughs> unit of measurement you prefer? I don't even remember because... Um, we used it mostly on the uh, on the uh, the snowblower, <laughs> shooting the elements for the snowblower. We had like hoses full of it. Um, you see on my Instagram, <laughs> because we had to clean up our own mess afterwards at the studio. There was uh, like a couple of people like just pushing puddles of blood into the drain. <laughs> so we used quite a lot and. Um, I think it, it, it's just the irony is that we didn't actually use it. <laughs> we shot it, we didn't actually use it. Ended up using a lot of uh, CGI to do the blood on the uh, on the, uh, the the snowblower because it ended up being like <laughs> nobody was into shoving like real stuff to the snowblower blade. So <laughs> we had well, to, plan to clean CG it then. CGI. So. Uh, the film definitely like fulfills its uh, its its genre obligations, um, if you will, in, in terms of like the the gore content, uh, some like incredible set pieces as well. I think the snowblower being one, the opening uh, salmon uh, gutting scene as well. It's just like one of the best opening scenes in the past several years. It's just phenomenally conceived and executed. And uh, curious for yourself, were were there some scenes that came before the actual like structure of the script? Like, did you know, like, I want to have a snowblower uh, bathed in blood in this film, for yeah, instance. That, that now I just have to figure out how to make it work. That was always, that was always there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know what came late? Uh, Joseph shitting on the car. That came, like, we, we did Moment that last minute. Moment of inspiration. Minute. Yeah, we did that last minute. Because we needed to introduce him in a way that got him in jail with his brother. And it was, like, <laughs> doesn't seem like it, but it's actually a pretty, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's a need to be there. He needs to shit on that car. <laughs> it's part of the story. <laughs> the mechanics don't work otherwise. So um, I, I, I uh, so we did that. Um, what was the question again? Uh, totally question was just, question. Uh, are, were, there some, were there some of those scenes that you know, existed oh, in yeah, terms of your yeah, yeah. You the, uh, the other scene too that we kind of made up on the spot was the uh, scene in the garage with the the, the zombie falling down, yeah. because uh, that wasn't originally written that way. So we had to kind of adopt it for the for the for the uh, for that particular location. There was a lot of that too. <laughs> oh man, we uh, we actually kind of made up the last fight scene. In, in the movie with the with the old man because we had planned on we built a wharf and we had planned on doing on doing it on the wharf and against this you know backdrop of the church but it turns out that particular day we had a flood like a like a once in a lifetime flood that that flooded the set that set at the beginning where you see the uh, old man shanty that floated away <laughs> and all this stuff that we had staged was actually underwater, so we couldn't do any of that shit, and we had to kind of make it up on the on the spot. So we ended up doing it up on that monolith. And the crazy thing about that that particular day, there was like you know gale force winds, and 
stunt guys didn't want to go up there because they were scared they were to get blown off. And you don't actually see it, but there's like a 20 foot drop. So there's like a ton of stuff that we either didn't shoot, shot differently, or, or ended up dropping because of budget from the screenplay to the screen. You can read that screenplay, it would almost seem like a, a different film because like we literally made a lot of stuff up on, like, on, on the spot just to kind of adopt to the budget or the weather or whatever the case may be. 1981, it was the same year of uh, the Alan Issa Bumsman film, Incident at Restowish. That, this, the, the contents of that film happened in 81. So that's kind of when I said it, it was like over the uh, salmon wars where uh, the Lustigish Reserve got raided for salmon fishing. It's kind of ironic because they're going through something like that right now with, with the lobster fishing. They're fishing without license and the last time they did that, the reserve got raided and uh, it was actually, a, if you haven't seen that film, a lot of people have seen her next film, or not her next film, but uh, the one she did on the Oka crisis and there was a lot of uh, stuff in there a lot of stuff in Blood Quantum that referenced reference that film too so I mean it was really kind of a uh, you know historical reference in the in the timeline of Alanis's films and in a lot of ways the political timeline of First Nations people in, in Canada where they started to almost have a, the first inklings of a civil rights movement around that time, 81. So, I mean, that's pretty much the reason why I had done it. I mean, it was, it was a direct nod to Alanis's uh, films and I wanted to contextualize it within the same political stratosphere as the, uh, a lot of the ideas that were going on in that film. So if you actually haven't seen it, you can go home and watch it. It's free, I believe, on the uh, NFP's website. He went to World War II when he was like 16 and he ended up getting injured and he ended up going to a hospital. And this hospital ever ends up getting overrun by the uh, Japanese. And he ends up killing one of these Japanese soldiers and taking his sword and his outfit and kind of fighting his way out of the, uh, out of the invasion. And uh, it's, it's a part of a bigger story about how all these GIs brought back these samurai swords in World War II. And it was kind of a, a nod to the, uh, the, the amount of service Native people have given to the armed services in uh, Canada and US. So it was a little bit of a nod to that. And actually, uh, Stone Horse in the film is a Vietnam vet. So it was, it was kind of just a, a, a nod to that whole scene and and kind of nodding giving giving an elder his time on screen and we couldn't have found a better person to do it than stone horse because he embodied a lot of of, of that that uh spirit because like i said he's a vet he was uh he was part of the aim movement and i think he just uh he was the part and he never had acted before either. He'd never done anything before. So it was just basically asking him to show up and be himself. <laughs> so, um, I mean, there's no particular native reason that he got his sword other than the fact that he was young on a reserve and he didn't have a lot of other options but to join the armed services to kind of see the world or to get a chance beyond these borders. But uh, it's, it's just the best weapon at killing zombies too, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> it had to be in there. And, and uh, the idea that it was set in 81 for like this, this, this political reference kind of gave us a bit of a, a space to cast him as if he were a World War II vet. And like I said, there was this scene that never got shot where he, you know, he fights for that sword before he takes it back to be like a, like a badass zombie killing grandpa. All right, well thank you so much, Jeff, for being here to talk about the film. Thank you. Thank you so much for you.
being here as well.